Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Todd Verrill. I'm with the IQ Business Group, heading up our document and records management team. And we have a lovely webinar to share with you today. I will be your moderator for digital content continuity beyond ECM. And it's going to be great. Um, while we're getting underway, please feel share to utilize the chat and share where you're from, what maybe your goal is for today and what maybe your pain point is regarding digital preservation or archival. I'm joined today by some friends of ours, our partners at Preservica. We've got Lori Ashley and Andrew French with us. And as always, my colleague Maggie Vandenberg with IQBG Marketing. A couple of reminders before we dive into a great discussion about digital content continuity. I'd like to cover uh, housekeeping items. By default, all participants' mics are muted, but please do uh, submit your questions through the question or the chat. We will collect all of those and address those at the end. And today's webinar will be recorded and made available to all participants for replay within 24 hours, so please be on the lookout for that email. For those of us Joining us for the first time, welcome. For those who have been on one of our webinars or have met us in the past, thank you for joining us again. IQBG is a leading provider of enterprise information management solutions. We cater to highly regulated industries and the public sector. Since 2008, we have been developing ECRM and content services solutions that leverage people, process, and technology, always supporting your requirements. We really try to focus on your business first, including the subject of today, the entire records management life cycle and how information management is impacted throughout all levels of the enterprise. This allows us to focus on technology next, recommending the best solutions fit. Let's talk a little bit about our guests today, Preservica. Preservica is a partner of ours and a natural fit partner, uh, to say the least. As an information management professional services provider, IQBG, um, our records management and ECRM offerings focus on, again, aligning technology with business and regulatory needs. That includes needs regarding long-term and permanent preservation and access capabilities. So this alliance with Preservica is really a natural one. Let's dive into some of what we specialize in and getting Preservica into the mix here. So from our experience, archival is a component of the RM life cycle, but we notice it's commonly overlooked during early project stages. It's all about ingesting, managing, scheduling, um, getting records in a system. And sometimes they take priority as organizations scramble to meet directives and deadlines. I've been included in stakeholders who have commonly viewed the use case for archive as a disposition, as something that we, we merely check the box on to make sure we've met that requirement but we don't really think about it beyond that, meaning it's the other period of time, not the one year, the three year, or the seven year schedule we're so focused on early on to address our project priorities. But let's think about that. What about long-term and permanent digital assets? Digital content is really, as we're learning, more fragile and fragile, sorry, and subject to technology obsolescence in a relatively short period. So planning for and taking preservation action for electronic records uh, with anything really beyond 10 years or more should be incorporated into the RM discipline, the plan, sooner than later. The question is, how do we incorporate archival? How do we integrate archival into what we commonly refer to as the records management lifecycle in ECRM? Next slide, please. So the answer here is like many solutions, we shift our approach. 
um, and we turn it on its head a little bit to address the problem. In this case, placing focus on all disposition use cases, including archival and preservation. These are merely dispositions. They just don't always get the attention like the other ones that I had mentioned. So let's, let's after framing this up, let's turn this over to our partners, but uh, to provide insight on this approach and much, much more regarding archival and preservation and some really cool examples and how you could begin your digital preservation journey um, really at no cost through Preservica's starter program. I am very pleased to introduce today's speakers. We've got Lori, Ashley, and Andrew French from Preservica. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Todd. We are delighted to be here. And uh, as, I, as you said, it's a very natural fit for us to align to IQBG because we are a highly specialized sort of player in the field. And um, this gives you a little bit of a sense of who we are. Our vision is that um, electronic information assets and electronic systems and all the valuable content they contain, we've got to figure out how to do this preservation stuff actively and make it business as usual. So it's not disruptive to the user, but we have the assurance and we can sleep at night knowing that digital assets, which as you said, are quite fragile, are protected for as long as the organization needs them. And that could be until the end of the Republic, which some days recently have seen, has seen uh, sooner rather than later, but um, that's a good one for the federal government. It could be um, in a company, it could be uh, forever or permanent or until a major event happens. So we're talking long-term, we're talking fragility and um, Preservica has a, has a software solution for a part of that life cycle. So Andrew and I are gonna tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so I'm gonna talk about preservation and fragility because this is really about the preservation of things that are valuable to your organization that are electronically stored and what needs to happen to them. I'm gonna share a couple of touch points on digital preservation good practices just so if you're not familiar with them, you are aware that all sorts of standards and good practices exist in the world. You don't have to start from scratch. Um, there's a well-worn path of the things we have to do to save electronic assets. Um, as Todd said, my colleague Andrew French is going to give you a demonstration of a new product that we have. It's built specifically to get people started on building out a um, state-of-the-art digital preservation archive. So this is our company mission. So who are we? Um, we're part of a global community working to find preservation solutions to the world's increasing reliance on digital information. So I will um, share a couple of perspectives on how our company evolved and um, highlight some of the challenges that our software solution helps practitioners to address. Um, and then we'll move on to the demonstration so you can see what it looks like in action. So a little bit about that shared commitment. I assume that the folks on the call, and, and we certainly know our friends at IQBG, are deeply passionate about and concerned about protecting the right information assets for as long as they, they're needed. And of course, we hope lots of things can go away and be dispositioned in a short period of time, but other many other things in the world today are stored electronically and need to stay around for a long period of time. So we share with records managers and archivists and historians and technologists this passion around protecting and preserving and providing accessibility to unique and valuable things you know, far into the future. So our roots back, um, date back to a project in 2003 um, when a small team headed up by our founder, John Tilbury, uh, worked on a collaborative project with the UK National Archives. And so what you see in this picture is the Doomsday Book, um, which is a 900 year old land survey ordered by William the Conqueror and Britain's earliest record. It is the foundation document for the United Kingdom's National Archives. So Preservica project, project team saw this original vellum book, that's what's sitting on top of that big chest, and were told that it was still readable by anyone with the right credentials and a command of medieval Latin. And so the challenge that came from the National Archives was whether or not someone reading a document in 2003, a Microsoft Word document, would be able to read it in 900 years time. So you can understand from our very foundation, the, the gravity of the mission that we took on, which is we have electronic information, we're gonna to have to save it like we're, we've been able to save other things in paper and parchment and vellum and microfilm and other formats. 
So that project resulted in a couple of tools, which are still used today. There's a technical registry called Pronom, which lists all sorts of um, file formats and, and what you do with them. Um, and there's also a, a file format identification tool because basically you can't preserve digital stuff unless you know what you're dealing with. And that's why a file format registry and an identification tool is so important to the, the workflow that Andrew will show you in a few minutes. So through a series of lots of increasingly challenging projects, um, collaboration with the global community, there's many, many people in this discipline who pay attention, by listening to our customers and aligning ourselves to standards which have evolved over time, um, Preserver could develop a active preservation platform of software, right, that, that does this preservation action. And we made it a SaaS offering, an offering in the cloud in 2012. So you can see here, we're trusted by public sector repositories around the world. In the US, 24 US state archives, um, and then many county city government, um, 16 national archives, and many other um, sort of big players who are in the forever business, if you want to call it that. But the truth of it is, is that digital preservation strategies and approaches and technologies and you know and uh, policies and all the, those good things really cut across every sector and every industry. So these are logos of our customers and they range from retail to consumer goods to newspapers, um, academic institutions, all levels of public sector, NGOs, and cultural heritage institutions. So the world's reliance on digital content says we've got to figure out which of this stuff we know we need to keep long term and we have to take action faster than we would normally do for hard copy um, assets because they're more fragile. So a couple of years ago we did a study with an organization called um, Information Governance Institute and we asked the, these IG people and records managers why, do you, why does your organization need long-term digital preservation? Why do you have long-term information? And the chart, which is probably hard to see, but we'll make sure you get a copy of these, ranges from the top where 89% of the folks who responded agreed that they had long-term information related to statutory, legal, and compliance um, obligations, all the way around to historical and marketing and brand heritage and you know all the reasons we know that people keep information long-term. It's to keep the ship running, to keep the schools operating to you know, um, provide pension dollars and, and uh, take care of people in health institutions. So basically um, there's a, a, a driver which is either you're gonna mitigate risk by keeping these records or you're gonna, you're gonna protect the value of your organization. So those are sort of two key drivers, but every organization keeps something long-term. And so that's why it's really a ubiquitous challenge that we have now in our modern society. So if you're in the records management discipline, these are things that you commonly think about when you think about life cycle. You know, do we get this in and we put it aside and maybe somebody will ask for it in a long period of time or is somebody gonna touch this on a regular basis for a few years and then get set aside? Are other people outside our organization gonna need access to this? How long are we gonna have to keep this thing? Um, and what format is our official record? Um, so this is just real common stuff. So um, we're going to have a poll now. Maggie's going to take back control. And we're interested in knowing what um, preservation approaches are you currently using in your organization for long-term and permanent records? And you can check all that apply. Um, it's real common to have all of these things simultaneously um, in play. And so um, we'll wait for a minute and let you tell us um, where you are sort of on the spectrum of protecting long-term. And I'll get to the, the definition of long-term, but for now use um, Use 10 years, records you keep for 10 years or longer. Um, how, do you, how do you manage them? And we'll see what you can tell us about your situation. I can tell you that um, we're seeing a lot of use cases now coming through from folks who have stopped microfilming a few years back because um, the equipment is breaking down or it's more difficult or it's more expensive or more difficult to get film. And so in our business, Andrew and I talk to lots of folks who are wondering about digital preservation. And sometimes um, what they tell us is that they no longer want to use microfilm or there's been a change in the regulation and they're now allowed to store permanent uh, public records in electronic format. Um, and so that's just something that we've been hearing um, on a more regular basis. Let's see, do we have some votes in? 
So I'll leave the poll open still for anyone who wants to continue, but so far it looks like 50% of people still use paper, 20% use microfilm, which I guess is reflective of what you were saying just now, 80% store documents on their native electronic format, 30% take things to an open standard tech, and 30% rely on third-party provider solutions. Okay, so that's a great mix. And it's, you know, it's just what we need to do because some of you probably represent jurisdictions that are, you know, 200 or older. Um, and so there's that continuous record has had to survive over various um, mediums. So let's move forward here. Okay, thank you for that. And we'll go on to a little bit more about this concept of digital fragility and why we, why we say that's the case. Okay, so in the digital preservation community, when we say how long is long term, we generally um, think of it as 10 years. And the 10 years comes from a couple different sources. There's a standard used in this space, which says long term is long enough to be concerned about the impacts of changing technology, right? And that that could, um, long term could extend indefinitely, certainly could be, you know, stated as permanent or never delete. So when you think about technology refresh cycles, they come fairly frequently. Um, every three to five years. And, and even though you may hang on to an application much longer than that, it's fair enough to consider that technology owned by someone, Microsoft or another vendor, that they're going to make changes over time. And, and in the future, they may drop um, the readability or usability of file formats if they're proprietary or other things. And Andrew can give you some specific examples on that. There was also a study done with technologists who basically said it's 10 to 15 years because that's when we begin to lose some of the control over the, the logical and physical migration. And an example from my neck of the woods, I live in southeastern Wisconsin and worked in the regulated energy industry for a while. This is one of two power plants in the Green Bay area. This is Kiwani, um, which was sold from its original owner. It operated from 1973 to 2013. It's been closed down. The major decommissioning activities won't even begin until 2069. So all of the records associated with that power plant, its operations, the store fuel rods, all of that stuff has to hang around for decades and be accessible to the engineers and other folks that begin the decommissioning activities and go through the closure process. So long term can really be a long time. So here's the issue. Since the 1970s, archivists and historians and technologists have been you know, clanging the bell saying, look, we've, we've got issues around being able to sustain digital stuff for a lot of reasons. You've got to have hardware and software to read it. Hardware and software is constantly changing. Um, there can be just big corruption and the loss of things just sitting on storage media. As I mentioned before, sometimes file formats stop being supported and so you can no longer open the file and see what's inside of it. Um, and then of course, you know, time marches on, business changes, different custodians come into play to manage systems. So this is where IQBG can really look across the entire life cycle and help do this planning for the eventuality of something needing to be protected or moved to a different system. And then in more recent years, um, analyst firms like Forrester and Gartner and others have come forward to um, add their voices to this course, which said that we've got some issues around the fragility of digital stuff. And if you don't take action, you know, you won't have it. Um, so what we really know is that um, there's common agreement that the preservation of digital information needs more proactive and continuous attention than other media. I'm sure all of you, as you said, you've got paper files, maybe they're hundreds of years old. You've got 30 year, 40 year, 60 year microfilm. So these were preservation media that we've used in the past. Now, if you wanna rely on saving those same types of records or collections, long term in only digital format, you're going to have to step up the pace of paying attention to those assets because of this fragility issue. So when we talk about digital preservation, we're talking about this continuity of action that has to be taken on those things which need to be migrated forward, right? And it's for all these change, all these reasons that we talked about, including changes in business requirements. We just need to do things differently. If you don't take action to preserve, you can't expect to have access. You can't expect to read them. You can't expect to produce an authentic record into the future. And of course, this applies to both born digital content, of which there's plenty in that chart that Todd shared with you. 
there's you know 100 or 500 different applications or platforms operating in your organization but still too between the pandemic and just the need to provide more records online to people remotely we've just seen a huge a huge push especially in the public sector to digitize older records and so when you combine the the payload of digitized assets and born digital assets it, you've got lots of things sitting around that need preservation action. So if you pay attention to what the U.S. federal government does, um, you know, they've put out there um, a set of universal electronic records management requirements. NARA's been, been doing some great work. Um, and last year in this um, UERM that is maintained through FERMI, the records initi uh, initiative, they added this new requirement, which reads, agency should have a record sustainability plan to maintain records over time. And that's precisely what we're talking about. If you have things on your retention schedule which are retained long-term, and you can set that threshold wherever you want. Maybe in your organization you say, let's make it 20 years, or let's make it you know, 15. Whatever that is, if you look at your retention schedule and see there's a lot of things, and then you look to see how are they being managed or do you want to manage them electronically, then you've got a, um, a rationale for preservation action, right? And you don't have to wait until the assets are at the end of their active life. There's things that you can do in, uh, sooner than that. And that's part of what um, Andrew will help um, explain to you. So when we think about maintain and use, not just capture, index, that whole upfront process to get them in, to get them organized, to make them accessible, we've got to think about that. what's that time period and what are those uses across the entire life cycle. And if the life cycle is permanent, like land records in the United States are born permanent records. So from the day it's captured and indexed in the clerk's office, the registrar's office, it's a permanent record. So if it's born digital or digitized after capture, can we act on it sooner? Do we have to wait, you know, 40 years or some longer period of time. So these are questions to think about. Is the life of the records longer than where they're currently stored? Am I gonna to need to migrate them in the future to another agency, to another unit, to uh, archives? Um, what am I gonna to have to do? So can the system where they're sitting take care of this migration, you know, conform, turning them into a open standard technology neutral file format or something else over time? And then what's going on underneath with all the hardware and software? How am I going to maintain the integrity and authenticity and accessibility of this content over long periods of time? So have no fear. There are standards. There are good practices. This is one of them. It's an international standard, and it's for the audit and certification criteria for trustworthy digital repositories. And this goes right back to what Todd initially said, is that records management or information management or information governance is the combination of people, process, and technologies. So Preservica is the technology component of preservation of digital assets, right? But this standard says, okay, you've got to have the whole thing working together. You've got to have governance and experts and funding availability. You've got to have contracts in place if you're using a third party. You've got to have the technology, of course. You've got to be able to pull the objects in and, and hook them up with metadata and act on them over time and keep all that information too. And then you've always got to be looking out ahead to make sure that you've got environments and controls that are going to keep the content secure um, and have integrity. So this, this is a very robust standard. And it says to an organization that wants to go on record as a trustworthy digital repository that you've got to think about all these things. So it's a good read. And there's, there's a self-assessment spreadsheet. So you can just download it and see what are all the categories of things that I wasn't previously worried about, but now I'm going to worry about. The other standard to know about is the one that we pay attention to at Preservica. It's a reference model for how a system, an information system, a technology system um, that you know serves a purpose, how it's supposed to function. And so it's really a it's a high level model, um, and we use it as the basis of the design of our software of the platform that we have. And basically, it's a model which says you get something, you get digital content from somebody, and you're the entrusted repository for it. So you take it in and you bundle up the metadata and you put it in um, storage in multiple geographic places because bad things can happen to good assets. 
Um, and then down the road, when somebody wants it, you have to have mechanisms which enable you to find the content and to bring it up to that person who's asking to see it. And that's what this, this standard um, encompasses. Another bit of good news is right now, the only um, trusted digital repository that's been certified and recertified to that whole standard is right here in the United States, and it's a government entity. It's the US public sector. It's the .gov um, site, and um, you can read about it, and there's one right here. It operates, and so it can be done, and this is these are the folks that keep the official government products of the legislature and the federal government. So, of course, it's a very, very important repository, and of course, we want to make sure that whatever is in it is true and authentic, and we can get to it over time. And that's exactly what this was built for. So you can look to this agency, this federal agency, as having achieved the highest standard in the world for having a digital repository. And then I think there are going to be more of these in the future, but right now there's just the one. So now we want to know, are you in your organization required to transfer permanent records to an archival institution? Because that will also tell us a little bit about you. And while you're answering that, I'll give you a minute to answer yes, no, it's quick. Um, I just want to talk for a second about, you know, what is, when we talk about valuable or unique information assets, what are we talking about? So I think that Todd and Maggie told us that some of you are from academic institutions. And so the kind of thing that you would um, keep, of course, student records, gifts and donations, maybe contracts, you might have regulatory compliance reports for affirmative action or other things like that. Your academic institutions will have um, library collections and will have special collections, manuscripts, donated materials, um, maybe materials from the community that form that body um, that resides in a repository like Preservica. If you're in the in public sector generally, as I said, it will be real property records um, from registrar and recorder's offices. It will be court records. It will be ordinances, laws, regulations, statutes. Um, vital statistics, birth, marriage, death um, certificates, building plans, transportation plans. Um, there's just a, a thousands of categories of stuff that has to be kept long term. So, Maggie, what's the answer to our, whether folks are required to transfer to an archival institution? So, 67% have said yes, 22 have said no, and 11 have said that they don't know. Okay, great. So that's useful. That's useful information. Okay, so let's go on here. I'm almost done and you almost get to see um, Andrew's presentation here. So if you are in, so if you have to transfer there, that's that disposition action, right? And there are rules about when you have to transfer things to archival institutions, typically at the end of the life cycle. For those of you who don't have to transfer permanent records to an archival institution, if they are maintained in digital format, you're in basically the same business as the archives now, because you need preservation methods. You need to identify the things that are going to have to have preservation action. You're going to have to move, you know, potentially move them into an environment or look for solutions that can act on those things and possibly transform them to fi other file formats. So we're now sort of all getting into the digital archive business because every organization has some of these things that are not archival, that are not historical, they're pure operational, right? There are records, we need them to operate the power plant or um, the um, university library or the health system. And so I've explained that what we have at Preservica is this active digital preservation platform and now Andrew's going to show it to you and so what happens is we take stuff into our repository and then we do all these things on it which keep it alive um, for as far out into the future as possible and since we since most of our early customers are from the archive end we're talking about permanent repositories so we have the same platform but we offer it in sort of small medium and large um, so Andrew's going to show you our brand new starter edition, which is it, we have a free edition and it's to show you what digital preservation does. Um, I suspect that you all come from organizations that need 
large systems eventually, but this is um, where you can learn about what digital preservation technology does um, and kind of get started because the, the free product's super fun to use um, and it can do a lot of a lot of really powerful things. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Andrew. Thank you, Lori and Todd. Um, and I'll just wait for that uh, share to come through and I'll share my screen. All right, and Maggie, can you confirm that you can see my screen okay? Yep, all good. Awesome, thanks so much. Hi everyone, I am Andrew French. I'm the Director of Solutions Architecture here at Preservica, and I'm going to take you through Preservica Starter and demonstrate how we are helping records and archives stay compliant with standards and regulations for long-term to permanent record retention in the ECRM lifecycle within an easy to use system. Part of what we do here at Preservica is to help institutions address the risks of data loss, all kinds of data loss from a, a very wide lens, but more specifically, what naturally happens to our digital files over time, as Lori highlighted. Files degrade and the access and context about the data contained in those files is lost. Just having a copy or a backup in the cloud does not constitute digital preservation. There's so much to consider in a full preservation policy requiring a deep understanding of the needs of really each digital format. And that's what we introduced with Starter to help you stay compliant and prevent data loss. So to kick us off, I'm going to leave here from the uh, Preservica sign-up site and let's look at Limestone County Archives in uh, Athens, Alabama, one of our early Starter users. This is the starter site, the front end for Limestone County Archives with a personalized background and an introduction to the archive. It's a public view of the digital assets held by that archive. You know, a lot of work has uh, been done uh, to, of the uh, really digitizing the work of records, images, and moving images um, that's been done and completed by the archive and, and by the county. And we know that's that's no small feat. And separately, a great deal of work has also been done to describe the content with metadata, but it had never really been joined up in a way that really creates those preservation quality packages to the standards that Laurie mentioned earlier as well. So jump to today where uh, the staff can log in to the cloud and easily upload records, videos, such as these uh, historic videos I can show you here about the county, and they can add metadata to accurately and thoroughly describe uh, the content. Uh, Lori mentioned that it's fun to do this. I would say that's absolutely correct. Um, it's very much like, you know, dragging and dropping content and then, you know, enriching that information with really important uh, data. So um, one thing that's unique about us is that, of course, in our records, we're going to have a lot of um, office related materials. But even with media that you might have, uh, we have media players that render natively in our system as well with no extra um, tools to have to um, download or maintain locally on our devices. It's all done here through the browser. So today, our starter users range from small archives and records doing everything themselves with high value content to larger public sector organizations just starting the preservation journey. Each of these only need to start uh, a way to start to um, you know, really kick off the program and demonstrate the value to stakeholders. And that's really what we do here um, for public and academic institutions to really help build that presence. Um, also, we have some corporates that are part of um, and some consultants that are part of Starter as well. So really, we Everyone's welcome to the table here. So let me jump into now my system. It's going to move into a different starter system. I'm going to close Limestone County here. Um, this is my demo system that I use. I want to really show you an example of the back office view of starter. It's the same tools used by Limestone County to create what you've already uh, just seen. So I'm logging in now and essentially starter bootstraps users in place with best practices. So there really isn't too much to configure in terms of administration. There are only a couple admin features such as the option to change your password and to switch between a light and a dark theme. Really quick, I wanna perform an ingest to show you really how easy this is. It's just drag and drop and I'll resize my browser um, to show you that. And I'll just take this content over here. You can all see it on my desktop. I'm in a Windows system and I will drag and drop and bring it over here. So I'm gonna let this run and come back to this in a moment to review. But first, I wanna show you the other tab on this um, page here, which all the way to the left is our dashboard. Now, Starter features a dashboard of reports. I'm gonna minimize the screen momentarily. 
it features a dashboard of reports that I can access by clicking on the icon or the full name. And really, if the goal of Starter is to kickstart the digital preservation journey and demonstrate the benefit of preservation to your institution, this is right away one of the more helpful tools to highlight on a tablet or share in a message to your stakeholders. You can easily show files that have been migrated to a best practice format for the long term, content that you have enriched with metadata, a quick preview of all the files that you have in your system being preserved today, and helpful workflow reports like recently deleted files, uh, information about the amount of storage being, that's being used today, previous login, and also quick access to our resource library, our support um, window here, and also the link to that public portal, which you just saw a version from Limestone County just a moment ago, all accessible here in my dashboard. Going back to Explore, really our goal in making Starter was to unify preservation tools into a series of routines that run behind the scenes so you can quickly get started um, really as quickly as possible with the goal of adding more options as your practice grows. So when you want to add and ingest your digitally born or digitized content for preservation, you just drag and drop, or you can use the add feature as I mentioned up here to create a new folder, upload a file or upload a zipped folder as well. That can all be done here natively. And I just did that a moment ago with the word perfect file into starter. And we can see that right here. Now, it's worth noting, I could not access this file on my computer anymore. I don't really have an application or tools needed to do so. I do have all the most common applications out there you might have on your computer. I have the Word Office Suite um, and different open tools, but um, WordPerfect, not really supported that much anymore. You have to download additional codecs or tools to really access these older formats, which really we all have somewhere, right? They're in a closet or a drawer or a thumb drive um, waiting to be preserved. So when I just drag and drop that content, um, the ingest workflow that I minimized, it brings you through all the different steps, all the different routines, uh, and creates notifications showing the status. So important preservation routines like you're going to hear characterization, normalization, storage diversification and migration, as well as virus and fixity check and saving content in archival packages. That's all included out of the box here with Starter and designed to best practices that Lori mentioned in preservation. It also performs full text indexing and thumbnail generation. Lori mentioned that we can actively identify over 1,900 different unique file formats contributed by the Pronom file format registry, which Preservica helped to create, and Lori did mention that earlier as well. Um, this is also enriched by the Preservica development team. So in short, that means Starter is able to identify or characterize your content automatically, not just based upon the extension of you know, .docx or .pdf, but really looking at the digital signature of each individual file and then take actions upon that information, um, as I mentioned previously. So now that the content is in my system, um, an asset is created over here which contains my digital file and my descriptive, technical, and structural metadata. And I'm going to click on this now and jump in and show you the content. So I'll jump in. And the first thing you see when you open it up is your metadata tab. This allows me to edit the descriptive metadata for the asset I just ingested here in the system. All right. It also shows options for me to download my asset. If I ever want to download the file again, I absolutely can. Uh, delete my asset. I can see the history of all the actions that have happened to my asset while it's in my custody. And I can switch to the public view that I mentioned before on the dashboard to see what my users are seeing in this case for this one individual asset. And the other tab here is the preservation history. This is where I can see my digital file safe in the cloud. So to diversify storage, Starter creates three copies of your content in the cloud at three geographically different data sites, each containing three different sets of hardware as an automatic safeguard for disaster recovery. Starter will continually perform fixity checking on your content, and if there are any issues, Starter will self-heal a damaged copy from one of the last successful checks in the system as well. So disaster recovery and um, business continuity are also a major part of preservation and what Preservica offers in Starter as well. So let me click on preservation history and I'll show you the content that I ingested. Now, here is my original WordPerfect file that I just ingested. It's still in the WordPerfect format, um, but to ensure long-term preservation of my data, we're going to automatically generate preservation and access copies of your data. 
Now, what the, the reason we're doing that is we want to make sure it's uh, done and uh, performed to the recommended stable formats, not based upon what you know Preservica as a company thinks, but it's based upon best practices and feedback that come from the preservation community, including archival testing, conferences, uh, journals, and, and so on. This is a major device in digital preservation, really, creating a practical strategy to migrate my files to increasingly stable formats over time to ensure data integrity and keep my data in the best shape possible for the future. So really start to organize your content as these generations here. So we can see generation two, the original, generation one. And really what we're doing here is we're organizing according to archival research and scholarship. The preservation copies up top here, including my original WordPerfect format, help to ensure the long-term integrity of the data over time. In this case, as a result of the migration automatically upon ingest, Starter also created an open document format automatically, a format with fewer preservation risks for the long term. As I mentioned, I can't open WordPerfect on my hard drive right now on my computer, so this is a more um, open format as we've seen and determined from the community. But it also created an access copy, a representation down here as a PDF, which is what my end users will see in a public view as PDFs today provide for quality access and are really easily accessed by browsers. So additional migration features, including the option to control and customize migration rules and to make additional generations than what you're seeing here are available at higher tier versions of Preservica. Um, and note that Starter will not make the migrations for all the assets, especially if they're low risk or if best practice preservation plans have not been accepted by the community. Otherwise, we helped you to build these um, different generations for long-term preservation automatically. I can see additional technical metadata extracted by Starter by clicking on the advanced information tab for each file. So Starter generates additional technical metadata such as the permanent unique identifiers um, for each asset and folder. It creates and will check the checksums automatically. As I mentioned, it'll create um, number of pages, uh, paragraph count, the application that created it. This is all done automatically behind the scenes for me. And you can, of course, always view your content, right? The most important feature, perhaps, besides knowing that it's going to be available forever, is the access, right? You can always access your content by clicking on the eye over here in the back office view, the Explorer view. And I can have access to content that perhaps I may not have access to for a very long time. Um, I could also download um, the other versions I mentioned before, the different generations from Starter as well. But in this view, I can. Uh, out of the box, turn it into a nice uh, table of contents. Legend, I can scroll through. I can go full screen if I want to for a very nice reading option. Um, I can search the full text here automatically and find, uh, for example, uh, all occurrences of pollution in this uh, land use permit application that I'm looking for here is 28 different occurrences of that. Um, I can also print if I need to here as well, or zoom as needed. So some really great tools built in for all different kinds of formats. I showed you video before. This is one of our um, office documents um, or related our viewers uh, that come out of the box with the system. I'm gonna close this and head back um, home to the top view of my screen. What I wanna do is address also the arrangement and description in Starter. So if your collections are already stored, I assume they are in a very specific hierarchical structure, or if you want to organize and arrange them, starters folders represent collections, sub-collections, or just folders to hold your content. So I'll show you an example here of public sector view, where I have a very intentional structure created by, um, by my organization that I loaded into the starter and even helped to create in starter. So I have files um, and um, records for a uh, registrar, a public library, uh, county records, I also have um, county archive information here. And if I jump into, for example, the county records, I'll see vital records, elections, courts, county clerk, and also codes and ordinances. And I'm just jumping through. And notice as I do that it does create a nice trail for me that I can click and move and rearrange if I need to within um, Preservica Starter really easily or expand. And just the same way as before, I can now expand upon an asset here. This is an ordinance um, related to traffic here. Uh, in my hometown of Salem, Massachusetts. And I can open this up and view it if I need to view the um, actions that have taken upon this resource here automatically in my system as well. We also had a collection for special collections here. Um, you may have more of a flat structure. You may want to have a structure also if you are just starting off. Um, it really is up to you how you want to describe your content. 
um, where I can easily jump in and listen to audio or view images or read text or spreadsheets, all managed here out of the box in Preservica here as well. Note that this one does have a blue line here, while this one does not. If I right click, you can choose which items are going to be public or private as well. So if I right click, it says this item here is public. It is viewable by end users in that front end view like we saw before um, for Limestone County, whereas my public sector collection, it's not public. Maybe it's still being worked on or it has some sensitive content in there. So this collection and all the content inside is private as well. Okay. So last thing I wanna show here is also the description of our asset. Let's return to that word perfect land use permit I showed before. So we do have a tab here for metadata. Um, automatically, we're gonna take the title of the file as it was ingested so we can still easily identify it when it comes in. I can change that title if I need to to something else really easily. Or I can also add additional metadata to describe my content easily and accurately um, as possible. What we've added here is two options. We have the option to describe in Dublin Core or mods. Dublin Core, as you may know, is the standard used most widely, I think, in the greatest number of industries and disciplines. Certainly, as we see here in Preservica, it's used quite a quite a bit. Um, we've added mods template as well as an option to capture rich metadata if you have this as well. They're both selected fields from the standard um, in both of these um, options. So let me uh, show you here. I'll add metadata for from Dublin Core to describe my um, land use option here. We'll just call this um, a land use, land application guide. And the creator will be uh, me, we'll say for the, for the moment, just for sake of uh, argument. And we'll put the date in here of 2020. Um, I'll put some basic information in and we'll, we'll be good for now. Um, I can save this up top. And when I save, note how it, makes, it puts all my fields together. It does not have a bunch of blank empty fields in between. It's very organized, very clean. And if I jump to the public view, um, this is what would be viewable to the end user if this item was flagged as being available to the public. Okay. All of this metadata is searchable in the default search bar up top here, also in that public front end view. So all that full text indexing is available. If I search for pollution, I'm going to retrieve this land use guide because pollution is mentioned um, within the item itself, uh, which is really important. So we have the really rich data um, indexing happening in our system as well. I also want to mention that, of course, all of your content can be downloaded upon request, including your metadata and starter really easily. So to conclude, what content types are a good fit for a starter? Well, for example, you may have records characterized by high volume, small size, or a few large files. You may have records managed in the servers that have you know, had backup but not preservation just yet. You may have a lot of born digital, ready to process. It's already there. Just start there. Um, or frequently requested stuff or things that might have a very specific need right now you want to start with first. So we're looking at, of course, you know, born digital, digitized, long-term or permanent records um, for your materials that you can go ahead and start with Preservica. So wherever you start is a good place to begin. We make it easy and you can get started right away. All right. So thanks for watching the demo and back to you. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> All right, okay. hang with us. We just have a few more comments to share with you and then we're happy to take any questions you might have. Okay, so I have a couple questions. Whoops, we have a couple of slides. Do you have the slide deck back up? Sorry, Maggie. Oh yeah, sorry. That's okay. There's one graphic that I just wanna show people. It helps. Um, and there's some resources in there too, but I'm sure I'm, the, the deck will be available so you can um, you can uh, check out those things later. But there was the one um, picture I just want to show you to get your, your thoughts moving in the direction of what might be good content in your organization to put into a repository like Preservica. And Lori, as we're waiting for that deck to come back, yep. every time I see this deck, every time I hear you guys talk about it and look at the technology, I always go back to about four uh, similar takeaways that really um, you know, can be integrated into how we help our clients with what we, what we used to always call ECRM and uh, approaching records management lifecycle. But really, just like you said, if you're in the business of forever, uh, continuity of action pays off for sure. And, and doing that sooner than later is going to minimize risk. So getting back to the the short-term retentions versus preservation. This is a this is a big deal at the Fed level. 
you know, Fermi includes that record sustainability plan. You know, that's a plan required by NARA, an agency that is dedicated to archival. So that says going for an RM program is is great and you're headed in the right direction, but it doesn't get you all the way and you should really, uh, you know, not just check that box regarding things like immutable content, cutoff retention disposition. Those are the, the common requirements we always go after. But I like that ISO spec adding 13363 to maybe, I'm a little bit of an ISO geek, but adding it to 15489 <laughs> to say, I've got my, my record system implementation covered and I'm planning for a sustainability plan. So just a, a few uh, bits of feedback and I'll give it back to you. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, there's the benefit of ensuring that something you need to keep long term will be accessible and readable and usable in the future. The other, you know, benefit is it helps in that whole push that we've been doing in the records management field for the last decade or so about that defensible disposition destruction, right? So we've got a lot of stuff. It's easy to make electronic content and getting the balance right of how do you keep the right stuff for the right amount of time and how can you defensively you know, reduce content and move it along. And so this is kind of a, an iteration of that. So what you see in this, in this picture is a simplified version of the life cycle, right? Capture, use and maintain and disposition. And the traditional paradigm is transfer to archives at the end of the life cycle. And you see that down at the, the right end. And what archives do is they use curation and preservation methods in order to keep whatever it is you've given them alive and accessible and retrievable for all time, right? We all have been to museums and archives and libraries. We know how they function, that they have control and security and they take excellent care of their assets. So there's that use case. If you're passing off down the road, you have an expectation that that archival repository has their act together and all the resources they need, right? Now moving upstream, you could have long-term indefinite. Let's say you have an adop adoption record that you need to keep until, you know, for X number of years until after the individual is 18 years old and the adoption happens when the child is two or three. You've got a record that you have to keep long-term um, or maybe it's a case where you want to, um, you have to terminate it or start the retention after an event into the future when you don't know what that's going to happen. Well, you might need a repository, a preservation environment for that because it's just going to hang around a long time. And then if you move all the way up to the left, we have the use case, which is it's born permanent. I'm a land record. The day you you um, seal me and sign me and index me at the clerk's office, you know you have to keep me forever. And so is it possible at that time to leverage a preservation environment that's going to be taking those preservation actions from the very first? And one of the things that Andrew had in his demo, um, which is a good Another example is meeting minutes from your board of commissioners or whoever is your governance board. Well, after they're approved, they're often made public. And so this is an example of where days after it's an approved, it's in a preservation environment and it's also made public. So we don't have to just wait to the end of the life cycle. We can take preservation action. But as Todd said, we have to think about it and integrate it into the way that we're managing our assets. So let me just move here. Go. I think there's just there's just some resources here before we turn to questions. Um, keep going on that one. So these are resources from mostly the U.S. government, um, and then there's a couple of Preservica resources. And if you are actually interested in using Starter, it's free up to five gigs forever, free forever. Um, and so that's how you can do it. But at this point, let's me stop talking. <laughs> um, thank IQDG for the opportunity to um, share about Preservica and share Preservica starter and um, move to questions. Thank you. Okay, so I have a couple questions here. First off, this question comes from Jim. Are there issues with Preservica and large video file storage? I can take that one. This is Andrew. Um, that's a great question. So uh, as I showed on the dashboard, we are able to preserve out of the box for free with Preservica up to five gigabytes. Um, the only limitation for ingest is the browser you are using. Um, certain browsers have limitations for size. Uh, some have two gigabytes, some have four. I believe with some tools you can bump it up to six. Um, other than that, there are no limitations to the size of what you can upload. 
Um, and just to add there, so we have customers using other editions of the product that have, you know, vast video or photo collection. So there's no limitation on the on the software side. And basically, the way Preservica software is, you have a subscription to whichever version of the product, and then you have storage. And the storage for us is a pass through. We don't charge for storage. So if you have lots of large files, you're going to need more storage. And that's just how it goes, which is which is fine. It doesn't matter to us um, the software really at all. Okay, and I've got another one, also from Jim. You mentioned TIFF as an archival standard earlier. Where do you see PDF and PDFA fitting in a preservation strategy? Oh, that's a great question. I'll take that um, as well. This is Andrew again. Um, yes, yeah, so TIFF is a very common format that we do see. Um, we're able to, you know, migrate TIFFs to um, other formats as well, of course, in our full Preservica product. When we ingest images and office and moving images, we do try to put into place the best practice that we see from the community. For example, a QuickTime movie might generate an MP4 access copy. Um, working with office materials and video files, we can move to different formats. PDF and PDFA are very common formats that we see as part of preservation policy. We know that PDFA has a special place in everyone's um, heart these days. It's a very long-term preservation format. Um, the preservation concerns that we take into consideration the most of course are coming from the community as a whole. Do we have the tools to open these formats for the long term? Do they have a dedicated um, community behind them supporting them um, besides just the um, owners of you know the main application that generates those formats. Um, so we do absolutely create PDFs as you saw for the word perfect. Um, we do generate PDFs as part of preservation plans, um, but the formats that are generated will differ from format to format based upon, again, those best practices. Well, and, and you know, the short-term strategy has been um, that you would pick one of those formats that was very stable, like TIFF or PDF or, you know, ASCII or whatever. So from the beginning, from the 1970s, archivists have been saying, you know, these are safer, there's no silver bullet. Um, and so it depends on your organization or how you're regulated, but it's kind of a good hedge if you use an open standard technology neutral file format. And it's what's commonly done. People use their copiers and whatever to make PDFs and it's your attempt to fix, right? To make it a fixed object and to preserve it. And so what we do inside the software is that and so much more, but Picking those formats is something that's still commonly done. And if you go to the NARA site, they have a list of sort of supported and preferred file formats. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're trying to give guidance on what formats, if you are if you don't have a system like Preservica, you ought to be doing or how you should prep the records before you send them to an archival um, repository. So yeah, there, there are lots of them that are out there in common use. Okay. and. I think we have time for one more. One more. This one comes from Mark. What are some examples of file formats that have gone obsolete? That is a great question. Obsolete file formats. Um, Lori mentioned that NARA puts out a list of um, at-risk formats. Those lists do have um, Really, we look at, instead of obsolete, in terms of risks that you might have, a format might be obsolete, but it still might be, in some ways, accessible by other tools. Um, you know, those open tools that we mentioned before, uh, how we transformed that um, WordPerfect into an ODT format that's used by open office tools and, and LibreOffice and systems like that that can open those very easily. Um, we do look to the NARA standards to see what are the preferences, and those change every year. There's new updates that might surprise you. Um, Recently, we saw this year, maybe it was just the end of 2020, um, some Canon raw um, images um, uh, outfits had been uh, moved to say these are now at risk. It's best to move those now to a new digital format. So um, we tend to think very expansively in terms of formats that are either you know obsolete or low risk or medium risk. Those are all taken into consideration um, when we make these migration choices. Yeah. And there's a resource, the Digital Preservation Coalition, I think it's DP org. Um, it's out of the UK, but it's a global community, and they actually keep sort of a at-risk registry um, of file formats, and they explain what the risks are. And so I would um, point you to that as a resource to do a little bit more exploration around file formats and, and how they're seen in terms of their um, vulnerability um, and how that might affect this whole idea of digital continuity over time. That's a really good idea. I agree with that 100%. Thank you all so much. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Todd and Maggie. Thank you very much. Yeah.
Awesome stuff, guys. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Andrew. And thanks for driving uh, Maggie, everyone on the call. Thanks for attending. That's going to do it for today. If you have liked what you've heard, please uh, reach out to us, connect with us on social media. And as a reminder, be on the lookout for that email indicating today's webinar is available for replay and of course get started with starter today as lori has mentioned it is free forever please stay safe stay healthy and we will see you soon